Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Uh, we come to one of the most popular parables in all of God's Word. It's one of those stories that you learn in children's Sunday school, uh, vacation Bible school. You see it in children's storybooks. It's a parable that has even made its way into secular society in a lot of ways. And we likely know it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, what's the real point of this parable? In Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, what is the real point Jesus is trying to make? Is it that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us? Well, we know that's true, that's biblical, but is that Jesus' point? Is it that we should do good to those who are hurting? Is it that we should be kind? Well, there's more to this story than meets the immediate eye. And I want us to see what it is Jesus is trying to communicate in this parable that we often take and apply in ways that Jesus wasn't necessarily applying it in this context. So first we see the context, the context of the parable. In verses 25 to 29, look at how Jesus is brought to the point of telling this parable. In Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, a lawyer, a lawyer. Now, this isn't the kind of lawyer we think of today. This is a lawyer who has studied the laws of Scripture. He knows the Torah. He knows the law. We're going to find that out in just a moment. A lawyer stood up. And put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? There's two words there that should jump out at us before we even go any further, and it's the two words, I and do. He's already started off on the wrong foot because he's asking Jesus, What can I do? What is it that I can do? What can I accomplish that would give me eternal life? And some of you, have asked yourself that same question. What do I need to do? I guess I need to walk down an aisle. I guess I need to pray a sinner's prayer. I guess I need to get baptized. I guess I need to go to church. I guess I need to read my Bible. I guess I need to pray. I guess I need to give my offerings. And when I do all of these things, I feel better about my eternal destiny. And you're no different than the lawyer. He wants to know what I do. He wants a list of do's. He wants a list of don'ts. And Jesus humors him, and he asks him in verse 26, what does the Bible say? He said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is really impressive when you think about the lawyer's answer. He clearly has a deep insight into the scriptures when he can sum up the law in this way. You see, he just really summarized the whole law with just a couple of sentences. The Ten Commandments can be divided. It's been said into two categories. There's the first table of the law, which deals with our love for God. The first four commandments deal with our love for God. Then there's the second table of the law, which deals with our love for neighbor. And really those ten commandments are a summary of the entire law of God. So what this lawyer has done is he's taken the summary of the whole law, which is the ten commandments, and he's even summarized them down in a more narrow way by saying, here's the, here's the summation of the whole law. Love God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor just like you love yourself. Now notice what Jesus says to his answer in verse 28. He said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Wait just a second. Has Jesus just given us a plan of salvation by works? Because I thought salvation was by grace through faith in Christ. And 
And Christ himself has just said, do this and you'll live. Do this and you'll have eternal life. Yes, do this. Live your entire life loving God with your entire heart, with your entire soul, with your entire mind, with all of your strength. Keep the entire law of God as it relates to loving God perfectly. And love your neighbor just like you love yourself at all times. Keep the whole law of God as it relates to loving others. Do this, never for one moment fluctuating in your love, and you will be perfect, and therefore you'll inherit eternal life. James 2.10 reminds us that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. The lawyer misses this. The lawyer misses this point. Look at what he says in verse 29. But wishing to justify himself. Now notice in the very first verse we looked at, he says, what can I do? Now he's trying to justify himself. Trying to justify himself. He said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now for most Jews, a neighbor, their neighbor, in their mind, was another Jew. A Samaritan was not their neighbor and definitely not a Gentile. So he just kind of leapfrogs over the loving God part. I guess he's got that down pat. And he goes directly to the neighbor issue. And he says, you know, I'm doing pretty good at loving God, so let's not talk about that. And I think I'm doing pretty good at loving my neighbor, unless, Jesus, you've got another definition of who my neighbor is. And Jesus, at this point, if I had been Jesus, I would have dismissed him. I would have said, okay, you're done, go away. I don't have time to try to convince someone as bullheaded and hard-headed and religious as you that you're a sinner. How many of you know that it is harder to get somebody lost in religious Tennessee, religious Bible Belt, than it is to get them saved? Everybody's okay. Everybody's fine. Everybody believes in God. Everybody knows about Jesus. Everybody's been to church at some point in their life. Everybody's okay. I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm not bad as Hitler was, right? So I'm okay. Jesus runs right into this with this lawyer. He's okay. But instead of Jesus dismissing him like I might have, he's going to try one more time to get him lost. He's going to try one more time to show him that he is a violator of God's law. And he doesn't love God, and he doesn't love his neighbor, and he needs to repent and come to Christ. And he's going to do that through a parable. So this is a context. Don't miss the context and jump right to the children's story. The context is, how do I go to heaven, Jesus? What, is this, what do the scriptures teach you, lawyer? That I need to love God like the law says, and I need to love my neighbor like the law says. And Jesus says, great, do that perfectly and you'll live. Well, I think I'm doing okay, Jesus. Now comes the content of the parable. Beginning in verse 30, Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him. And that word beat there in the literal language means that they beat him repeatedly. Repeated blows. And they went away, leaving him half dead. So here's a man innocently making his way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He is attacked by a gang of, of robbers. They beat him repeatedly until he's on his way to death's door. And they leave him there to die. He's hopeless. He's helpless. And in verse 31, by chance a priest was going down on that road. Good news here comes a priest, a servant of God, a man who knows the scriptures. Scriptures like Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Surely a man who knows the Bible teaches to rescue your enemy's ox and donkey knows that he should rescue a fellow Jew who is suffering in the ditch, waiting to die. 
Micah 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This priest knows these scriptures. Thank God that he's coming by. He not only knew the scriptures, he served others. That's what he did with his life. He offered up sacrifices on behalf of the people. He prayed to God on behalf of the people. And now here's one of his people. He's a godsend. But the latter part of verse 31 says, When he saw him, he didn't miss him. He saw him. He passed by on the other side. Now in the literal Greek, it doesn't just mean he passed by on the other side. Literally, Jesus uses a verb that literally implies that the priest went the opposite direction. He saw the guy. He turned around and went the opposite direction. Maybe he was afraid of what would happen to him. Maybe he was afraid there were robbers waiting for him. Whatever the case, this man who knows the scriptures and gives his life serving people goes the other way when he sees this man in need. In verse number 32, Jesus says, likewise, a Levite also. Now, Levites, like the priests, came from the line of Levi. They came from the tribe of Levi. But the priests came from the line of Aaron, the Levite. The other Levites don't have Aaron as their great, 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 great grandfather. So they're a little lower on the Levitical totem pole, so to speak. They were assistants to the priest in many cases. Now, this man has a renewed sense of hope, doesn't he? Maybe the priest was busy. Maybe the priest had somewhere to be. Now, here comes a Levite, another brother. But the Bible says in the latter part of verse 32 that when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, the audience, just like if you're telling the story of the three little pigs... You know what follows the pig who built out of straw. And you know what follows the pig who built out of sticks. It's the pig who built his house out of what? Bricks. You know the storyline. And then when the Jews tell stories, there's a storyline. And the storyline goes like this. Priest, Levite, Jewish layman. Everybody who's listening to this story is on the edge of their seat waiting to see what the Jewish layman is going to do when he comes along and passes his Jewish brother in the ditch, beaten and left for half dead. But Jesus is about to throw a twist in the story that would give them all whiplash. Verse 33, but a Samaritan. A Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. Now hope is still gone. This man is still helpless because we would assume that this man, this Samaritan, is not going to be any help at all because Samaritans and the Jews despised each other. And so here comes a Samaritan. Not only is he a, not only is he a stranger, but he's an enemy. But we read in the latter part of verse 33 that when he saw him, rather than going on the other side or going the other way, he felt something. He felt compassion. Now remember, remember, this is not a true story. This is not anything that actually happened. Jesus is making up a story. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Could it have happened? Yes. But he's not giving us the account of something that happened. He's making up a story to make a point. And he could have chosen anyone that he wanted to choose to be the hero of this story, but he deliberately chose an outsider. He deliberately chose a hated person for the hero in the story. He saw him, and unlike the priest, unlike the Levite, he felt compassion for this guy. In verse 34, he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Now, this is a far-fetched story, people. A Jewish man has been beaten, left half dead. The priest is afraid. The Levite passes by. And here, a Samaritan, a despised enemy of the Jews, stops. And he not only stops, but he takes his clothing, his cloth, and makes bandages for this man's wounds. He pours his oil on this man's wounds. He pours his wine on this man's wounds. He puts this man, his enemy, on his own donkey he takes this man into town and goes into the inn with him and stays overnight nursing his wounds and turning his life around and then he pays the bill and even more so and then tells the innkeeper if my money runs out keep taking care of this man and when i come back through i'll pay the rest that is owed and everyone who hasn't learned this story in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and in children's storybooks that were listening to the sound of Jesus' voice in Luke chapter 10, everyone is shocked out of their mind. And Jesus ends the story. Which leads to the third thing we need to see in verses 36 and 37, the conclusion of the parable. In verse 36, he concludes the parable with a question for the lawyer and also for everyone else in the crowd. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Now, Jesus is just too sharp because he doesn't even answer this lawyer's question. Do you remember what the lawyer's question was? The lawyer's question was, who is my neighbor? Who qualifies to be my neighbor? Jesus creates a new question, a more applicable question, a better question. And the question is not, who qualifies to be my neighbor? The new question is, what does it look like to love my neighbor as I love myself? It's not about who's your neighbor. It's about what type of love fulfills the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself he says in verse 36 which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands and he said the one who showed mercy toward him and Jesus said to him go and do the same go and do exactly what he did now on the surface This story seems like a simple story about being kind and being neighborly and doing unto others. And those are great things to take away from the story, but that's not the point. The story is told to a self-righteous, pride-filled, religious unbeliever who thought he could be good enough to do what it takes to enter the kingdom. This is what it takes, lawyer, all the time to earn your way into God's kingdom. Whenever you see a stranger in need, even your enemy, you need to set aside your agenda. You need to stop and put yourself in harm's way. You need to use your resources to bandage his wounds. You need to use your resources to medicate his wounds. You need to use your paycheck to put him up in the hospital. You need to stay and be his personal nurse while he's in the hospital. You need to pay his hospital bills no matter how much they are and no matter how long he's required to stay. This is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, Mr. Lawyer. Have you ever done that for anybody? Have you ever loved strangers, even enemies, this way at all times? Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36. We looked at this several weeks ago. You love those who love you. What benefit is that to you? For even sinners love love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who from you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. 
Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil, but, but be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. That's exactly what the good, quote-unquote, good Samaritan did in this story. He did Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36. And Jesus is looking at this lawyer, and he's saying to the lawyer, this is how you need to love your friends, your neighbors, your enemies in this way. Every day, every time, perfectly for your entire life. Now, is there anybody that we've ever done that for, people? I'm not talking about every day of our entire life. I mean, have we ever done that for anybody? Have we ever loved like that anyone? Absolutely we have. I'll tell you who we've loved that way. We look at them in the mirror every morning when we get up. I mean, if I had been beaten half dead, I would want to bandage my wounds. I would want to medicate my wounds. I'd want to be transported into town and put in the hospital or put in the inn. I want to be taken care of no matter how much it costs. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It doesn't matter. Why? Because I love me. Listen, we live in a society where we love me really good, don't we? There's somebody that we've loved exactly like this, and it's ourselves. Not necessarily our friends, not necessarily even our families, not even our neighbors, not even our enemies for sure. But listen to what the commandment says. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you should love your neighbor as, as what? Come on. You're outside. You can say it loud. As who? Yourself. Amen. Do you want to inherit eternal life? Love your neighbor like you love yourself for real. Jesus says to him, go and do the same. Now, what is this supposed to produce in this lawyer? Acts of kindness. Well, I'm going to go out and I'm, I'm going to give more money to charity. I'm going to spend more days serving. I'm going to do my best to, to love my enemy, love the stranger, love my friend, to fight for those who can't fight for themselves. I mean, it's all fine and good, but that's not the point of the parable. Jesus' story is not meant to produce acts of kindness in the lawyer. It's meant to produce conviction. He's giving this lawyer one more opportunity to say, Jesus, that is impossible. I can never love my neighbor this way. I can never love anyone like that every day of my life. I'll never get to heaven if that's what's required. And notice, we haven't even talked about what a love for God looks like that pleases him. If this is what a love for neighbor looks like that pleases God, what kind of love for God would please God? What does it take? What does it look like to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? If this is what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself, I'm going to tell you, this, this parable should not leave us feeling giddy and motivated to do, go do kind things. This parable should lead us feeling conviction and feeling hopeless and feeling helpless because we can never do enough to get to heaven. We can never justify ourselves enough. We can never love God rightly and love our neighbor rightly. And therefore, we are headed to hell. Every last living one of us. Boy, just think if the sermon ended there, wouldn't it? Thank God the sermon doesn't end there. We get brought really low to hear good news. And the good news is that somebody came in your place and lived perfectly. Jesus loved God perfectly. Jesus loved others perfectly. And he can take his perfect record and he can apply it to your account. Not only that, but he took your failure to love God perfectly. He took your failure today, yesterday, and tomorrow to love your neighbor perfectly upon himself and went to the cross. And there on the cross, 
That sin, that failure, that shortcoming was judged by the Father as He poured out His wrath upon our sin, upon His Son, upon that cross until the payment had been paid in full and His blood has washed away our guilt and has washed away our sin. You can't love God. You can't love your neighbor the way God requires you to love God and to love your neighbor. But thanks be to God that He stepped out of heaven and did not count equality with the Father a thing to be grasped, but He came to this earth as a human being and humbled Himself and proved to be obedient, loving God and loving others just like we're supposed to do and obedient even to death on a cross where He took our sin upon Himself. You can leave this place today and you can do what the lawyer did and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try to do better. And be a religious unbeliever. Or you can make a, a trade. You can make a trade. You can give Jesus your sin and your failure to obey the two greatest commandments. And all the other commandments in scripture. You can trade Jesus your sin and your failure. For his perfect righteousness and holiness. Listen. There's only one way we win. There's only one way we win. Just make the great exchange and give Jesus our sin and take from Jesus His perfect righteousness. By repenting of our sin, turning away from our sin, turning away from our self-righteousness, our religiosity, our efforts, and turning to God through faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. God, we thank you for this parable. We thank you for the context in which you told this parable and how it should drive us to look to you, to cling to you, to appeal to you, to hold on to you as our only hope. I pray that we leave here today with great hope, but hope that is only in you. And it's in the name of Jesus, we pray and ask all these things. Amen.